Robert Moore presents Beneath the Surface, Psychic Structure, Gender, and Wholeness. He is introduced by Peter Mudd. In recent years, his work on masculine psychology has made his name a household word in any discussion of gender. King, Warrior, Magician, Lover as one book, or as the recently completed Quaternio of single books on each form of masculinity, has provided a mapping of self that has enabled thousands of men, often bewildered by the clash of new and old social expectations, to begin to locate themselves and begin the struggle of sorting out a sense of consolidation that allows an emergence of a comfortable and multifaceted authenticity. This morning, Bob will lead us into his understanding of the basic structures that underlie conceptions of gender and the promising new partnership that men and women are joining in, in an effort to embrace the next crucial step in the development or evolution of human identity. While Bob's work in recent years has focused primarily on masculine psychology, I know that his ultimate concern is intensely driven by the idea of species cooperation and planetary individuation. In short, he's profoundly invested in the human community and its intimate linkage to the earth. What you'll hear this morning underlying and motivating the paper about what underlies and motivates men and women is a deep compassion for life and an intense commitment to meet it as fully and seriously as possible. Would you please welcome Robert Moore. Thank you very much, Peter. We uh, have a lot to do in a very short period of time. I know that you've been engaged in exciting discussions of all of the different facets of our topic for this conference. I have heard uh, reports about the creativity and the generosity, uh, and as Peter said, the empathy which has, uh, which has uh, characterized discussions. I sure hope that continues after this address. <laughs> I want to uh, I want to do several things in our brief time together. I would like us to to ground uh, my discussion of this uh, topic beneath the surface: psychic structure, gender, and wholeness. I would like to uh, ground it in uh, in the Jungian uh, uh, blessed rage for order in discussions of the anima and animus. And I would like to focus uh, our discussion on a number of different issues. This is toward the end of the conference, and so I want to, to uh, raise a number of questions that will help us to locate ourselves and our position on a number of these issues. So first, I'll just begin very briefly by... by uh, talking a little bit about Jung's view of anima animus and subsequent critiques. I'll only spend a few minutes on that. And then I will try to ground us uh, in what is distinctively Jungian about talking about this sort of thing, because it's possible to talk about this topic from any conceivable theoretical perspective. And I would like to, uh, to call us to thinking about uh, this in the context of the collective unconscious, which I think is a distinctively uh, a Jungian way of approaching this. And um, then I will talk about a little research evidence that uh, should pique our curiosity about this and close with presenting uh, my own model of uh, of understanding uh, deep structures in relationship to gender and how they relate to what I believe to be presently asymmetrical uh, trajectories toward wholeness in males and females, and close with a with some comments on implications for 
uh, culture, social, public policy, uh, some implications for spirituality, uh, etc. So there's a lot to talk about in a very short time, and I'm just going to jump in. Here are some of the questions that uh, that we should have on our mind as we reflect on this. One, is there coding in the inherited biopsychosocial schemas of our species which may press toward an asymmetry in the journey of the human self toward individuation, uh, cohesiveness, and wholeness as a self. Um, there are a number of positions that have traditionally been taken on that and are being taken on that now, and you've probably heard them articulated in your discussion groups. How are the concepts of anima and animus related to the concepts of self and shadow? Uh, are there any structural relationships which can be discerned here? Or, or was Jung, uh, his, Jung's, or his traditional formulations uh, useless and something to be gotten beyond? Does gender asymmetry really exist? If it does exist, what is its nature if it does exist, is it merely socially constructed? Is there any evidence uh, that's useful about this? I understand that you've had a number of persons presenting evidence related to this. Then so what if there is gender asymmetry? What are we to think about that? What are we to do about it? So that's some of the territory that we're going to be talking about. Let me just start with, uh, with uh, some of the comments of Jung, which uh, have been the source of great heat uh, about this anima animus issue. And uh, let that be a context for a discussion of these, these uh, ideas. First, let me share with you some of Jung's com comments about the anima. First, he was talking about his discovery of it. This is from Memories, Dreams, and Reflections. It had never entered my head that what I was writing had any connection with art, and then I thought, perhaps my unconscious is forming a personality that is not me, but which is insisting on coming through to expression. I knew for a certainty that the voice, that is an inner voice, had come from a woman. I recognized it as the voice of a patient, a talented psychopath who had a strong transference to me. She had become a living figure within my mind. I was greatly intrigued by the fact that a woman should inf interfere with me from within. My conclusion that she must be the soul in the primitive sense and I began to speculate on the reasons why the name anima was given to the soul. Why was it thought of as feminine? And later I came to see that this inner feminine figure plays a typical or archetypal role in the unconscious of a man, and I called her the anima. The corresponding figure in the unconscious of woman I call the animus. and from the Collected Works, volume 13. The anima can be defined as the image or archetype or deposit of all the experiences of man with woman. Every mother and every beloved is forced to become the carrier and embodiment of this omnipresent and ageless image which corresponds to the deepest reality in a man. And then about the animus. In its primary unconscious form, the animus is a compound of spontaneous, unpremeditated opinions which exercise a powerful influence on the woman's emotional life, while the anima is similarly compounded of feelings which thereafter influence or distort the man's understanding, as in the quote, she had turned his head. 
And as feminist writers have pointed out, Jung uh, focused more on the anima than he did on the animus. The effect of anima and animus on the ego is in principle the same. This effect is extremely difficult to eliminate because in the first place it is uncommon and immediately fills the ego personality with an unshakable feeling of rightness and righteousness. In the second place, the cause of the effect is projected and appears to lie in objects and objective situations. Consciousness is fascinated by it, held captive as if hypnotized. Very often the ego experiences a vague feeling of moral defeat and then behaves all the more defensively defiantly and self-righteously, thus setting up a vicious circle which only increases its feeling of inferiority. Just as the anima becomes through integration, here's a little, his attempt to move toward a, a view of wholeness with regard to these issues. Just as the anima becomes through integration the eros of consciousness, so the animus becomes a logos, and in the same way that the anima gives relationship and relatedness to a man's consciousness, the animus gives to woman's consciousness a capacity for reflection, deliberation, and self-knowledge. And in the context of something I want us to think about today, in the light of some research about the life cycle, anima and animus through the life cycle. Uh, in Modern Man in Search for Soul, Jung says, we might compare masculinity and femininity and their psychic components to a definite store of substances of which in the first half of life unequal use is made. A man consumes his large supply of masculine substance and has left over only the smaller amounts of feminine substance which must now be put to use. Conversely, the woman allows her hitherto unused supply of masculinity to become active. This change is even more noticeable in the psychic realm than in the physical. Very often these changes are accompanied by all sorts of catastrophes in marriage. We'll be thinking about that a lot. For it is not hard to discover what will happen when the husband discovers tender feelings and the wife her sharpness of mind. Now, as all of you know, you've all studied this, uh, in the Victorian era, these kinds of uh, characterizations of uh, masculinity and femininity uh, were so common as to be uh, not that uh, controversial in European uh, Victorian culture. Uh, in our time, however, as uh, the politics of ideas have become an agenda which uh, demand attention, uh, this kind of uh, uh, what is considered sexist kinds of viewpoints about masculine and feminine uh, traits, uh, what constitutes masculinity and femininity has, has uh, come much to the fore and has uh, led to a great deal of controversy about Jung's ideas on this. If you haven't seen some of this discussion, uh, I refer you to a volume in the Paulist Press series that I edit on Jung and spirituality in the uh, Jung uh, in Christianity and Dialogue volume subtitled Faith, Feminism, and Hermeneutics, and in there we published a number of uh, articles which bring this uh, uh, argument about anima and animus uh, some attention in the feminist uh, uh, critique. So anyway, uh, one, let's look at uh, some of the strategies that have uh, been attempted uh, just briefly to, to uh, relate to this issue. One strategy has been that of uh, our colleagues uh, uh, in James Hillman's tradition, known as archetypal psychology by many. Uh, the strategy uh, in that tradition has been to 
broaden the concept of anima so that it is no longer uh, gender specific. And in that tradition, uh, anima begins to be a word which has to do with that uh, psychic reality which elicits great fascination and interest and attachment and uh, uh, enthusiasm in us. And so there is a sense in which anima then no longer serves the kind of structural uh, function uh, as it did in Jung's formulations. So, so the strategy there is to broaden the concept, apply it to both genders, have it be a major idea relating uh, uh, to the person's struggle with soul work and soul making. Uh, other attempts on this have been to throw the whole thing out completely. And in your discussions, I'm sure that you have uh, heard persons who would just as soon throw out the whole idea of an engendered unconscious uh, out. That is to say, Jung's idea that there's a two million year old self and that, uh, that predispositions with regard to gender are inherited. So <clears throat> let me just locate where, where my tradition is on this. Um, I personally think we have to think very seriously about theoretical assumptions when we're dealing with these things. Uh, uh, facts are always interpreted through theories. Uh, my sense is that in Jungian psychology, for many years now, we've had a number of different readings of Jungian thought. Uh, archetypal psychology, I think, has taken an Adlerian reading. Uh, the so-called developmentalists have taken a Freudian reading. Uh, it's been difficult for many to figure out what to do with a Jungian reading of Jungian thought. Although it has not been without persons who've been trying, and one of the persons that, uh, that I admire about this in trying to reconnect um, Jungian discourse to the idea of uh, biology and biological inheritance and uh, the archetypal realm has been Anthony Stevens. And for a context to uh, my own thought, it, I always want to suggest that you look at Stevens' body of work, and uh, in particular his latest uh, book called The Two Million Year Old Self, which were a series of lectures he published uh, 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 from a lecture series in Texas. Uh, what Stevens does is to point out that, that it's possible for us today to reclaim Jung's understanding of the collective unconscious and to ground it with a number of different sources um, in scientific studies. Uh, he points out the relationship between Jung's thought and uh, contemporary sociobiology, uh, between Jung's thought and uh, structuralism, uh, the uh, French school of structuralism, and uh, a number of other uh, scientific studies of linguistics, behavioral biology, uh, etc. In this, he argues very strongly that the concept of archetype is by no means uh, outdated, that it can be understood as closely related to what behavioral biologists have talked about as innate releasing mechanisms in uh, our behavior as a primate species. They call these IRMs, innate releasing mechanisms. He believes, along with these behavioral biologists, that every animal species possesses a repertoire of behaviors. These behavioral repertoires are dependent upon structures that evolution has built into the central nervous system of the species in question. Uh, each of these innate releasing mechanisms, uh, Stevens argues, is primed to become active when an appropriate stimulus is encountered in the environment. 
when the stimulus appears, the innate mechanism is released and the animal responds with a characteristic pattern of behavior which is adapted through evolution to the situation. He relates this, Stephen relates this work to Jung's concept of the archetype and argues, I think, uh, to me convincingly that uh, in spite of all the tendency to get theological about archetypes, uh, it is very important for us to, before we run into theological and philosophical implications of archetypes, to remember that Jung did uh, see these things as related to what we would know today as epigenetic rules uh, controlling the uh, psychosocial development of the individual. That is to say that for all species, there are inherited epigenetic pathways toward becoming what the animal is. Be suggesting that uh, that individuation is a concept that needs to be seen. Individuation and wholeness is a concept that needs to be seen in the light of this these uh, in, innate releasing, releasing mechanisms, uh, species-wide patterns of behavior, epigenetic rules, epigenetic pathways. These are compatible with the hypothesis that Jung had proposed, and. Um, was very central to his developed work. Now, <clears throat> there are, there's a lot of research related to this, and Stevens in his work has laid out a lot of it, and I will not take the time to, to get into a, to a lot of this. But I do want to point us to some research that uh, is fairly recent, which raises a lot of these questions about gender asymmetry and about the different uh, trajectories of male and female in the life cycle. And then I want to raise the question about whether this constitutes different differences in masculinity and femininity or whether this uh, constitutes differences in trajectories toward wholeness, which may be a different thing. And um, let me first just re report to you some recent uh, research that I discovered uh, after publishing these books, uh, I'm sad to say. Uh, it is, a, um, it is a, a, a body of research reported by in the, in the uh, book by David Gutman, G-U-T-M-A-N-N, -N, called Reclaim Powers Toward a New Psychology of Men and Women in Later Life. Now, Gutmann is a Northwestern University research psychologist. He is not a Jungian. He has a great deal of respect nationally as a researcher into family issues uh, uh, through the life cycle. And uh, this book is of great interest to us for our conference today, and uh, uh, I don't know how much you know about the status of publishing today, but you know if your book doesn't sell a whole lot of copies very quickly, they remain written and let it go out of print. This book was published in 1987, immediately went out of print. Um, I'm trying my best to get them to republish this thing now. But let me just summarize a little bit of uh, Gutmann's research and how it relates to our questions that uh, are raised by this question of anima, animus, this question that Jung raised about masculine sub substance, feminine substance as they go through the life cycle. And then I will present uh, the model of, of, uh, of uh, deep structures, which I think makes some sense out of this data without getting us into the uh, traditional traps. What Gutman did was to bring together all of the research he could find about men and women's development through the life cycle cross-culturally. And in the context of the research that he could find, he ran his own research project in which he studied uh, Navajo, Maya, the Druze people of Galilee and the Golan Heights, 
um, and Americans from Kansas. <laughs> what he did was to give people, give these people, uh, men and women from these different culture backgrounds, the thematic apperception test, the TAT. And did it through the life cycle, looking at the responses on passivity and aggressivity, on nurture and affiliation, et cetera, et cetera. And what he came out with, uh, it's very complicated, and in the book that I mentioned, reports all of this in great detail with the statistical graphs and so forth that relate to it. Uh, <clears throat> but what he found was very interesting, given our topic. He found that there's enormous evidence cross-culturally that males in the first half of life are extremely aggressive and that cultures around the world have struggled to find ways in culture, socialization, ritual forms to help young males cope with this aggression in the context of community. that this is by no means simply a problem of Chicago and American cities. He also found something, and we know this about young male aggression from, from many kinds of experiences, but he also pointed out that after the middle midlife that males tend to become far more passive they begin to be far more affiliative cross-culturally. They begin to be much more centered in relationship and much less interested in competition. Females, on the other hand, he found in these cross-cultural studies tended to be very, very involved with child rearing. He found that they were very, very committed to and invested in interpersonal relationships. That they tended to allow the males particularly the young males in their culture, to carry the aggression to the periphery of the groups in which they lived. He found, however, that at midlife, that cross-culturally, from the studies that he had made, women began to get more interest in power in competition, in aggression in many different forms, that their interest in power, their claiming of power, their utilization of power for the community was on a upward curve almost universally. Now, he also noted that it was during the child-rearing period that uh, in pair bonding for the purposes of child-rearing that both males and females tended to mitigate their narcissism and to focus on child-rearing and with the onset of later life in the groups that he studied and remember, these were recent, fairly recent studies. That this uh, this relinquished narcissism started to coming back. We've all heard of second childhoods. Well, apparently, this was present in the different groups that he uh, studied. 
So he characterized the movement from uh, uh, in males from, as he puts it succinctly, from being warriors to being peace chiefs among a lot of these peoples. And women moving from nurturing figures primarily to being uh, powerful women elders uh, in the groups. Now, what are we to make of this? Remember Jung's comment about the life cycle uh, dimensions of this. Are these trajectories in masculinity and femininity, or is it more complicated than that? What I want to suggest to you is that we are seeing phenomena which are indeed reflecting inherited tendencies in our species. But I think we have to look far more carefully at this and think about it uh, very carefully before we conclude that the older woman's aggression makes her more masculine or that the older man's receptivity makes him more feminine. Gutmann did not have uh, a very elaborated model of the self. He was not a self-psychologist, we could say. And so as he looked at this, he came to conclusions very close to what Jung's traditional formulations were. He suggested that this increasing passivity and receptivity and affiliativeness in older males really was a feminization of the male. And he pointed to the uh, research showing uh, increased suicidal behaviors, uh, much increased depression, and much increased addiction on the part of old ma older males cross-culturally. I don't know how many of you realize that, uh, that suicide is, is a, a very close competitor with heart failure uh, in the deaths of older males. Um, but Gutmann took a point of view very similar, he, and he also tended to see the increasing assertiveness of older women as the masculinization of older women. I think there's a way in which he has fallen into the same trap that Jung himself fell in. And here I want to have us turn to uh, the work that I've done in trying to understand something about archetypal systems in the human self, which can account for this data without locking us into an idea of um, a crossover of gender when you, when you reach midlife. And let me just outline for you a number of assumptions which I have made in my work. Now this work is published in the uh, book that uh, that has just come out from the International Congress that Peter mentioned. Uh, there is a summary of my, a short summary of, uh, of my work on the, these deep, deep structures, which you can look at, and I'm just going to briefly sketch. Let me spare you the history of my work and just, and just go into the assumptions which I have come to make based on my research. If you look at Anthony Stevens's book, he delineates a number of archetypal systems which he finds a great deal of evidence for. These systems, he points out, relate to nurturing 
and adversarial behaviors and affiliative behaviors. And later in the book, he points out that these archetypal systems also exist for healing behaviors. He does not really have any sense of a structural model of this. Um, in my work, I have come to believe that there is indeed a structural model for this that there are four fundamental lines of development, not one, not two, uh, as some other psychoanalysts say, but there are four fundamental lines of development which correspond to the quadration of the world that Jung pointed out in so many ways uh, in his discussions of the quaternio. Not only are there four lines of development these lines of development operate as archetypal systems in the formation of a mature and cohesive self, both male and female. And they are not randomly organized. Just as Freud had seen a tension between eros and aggression, a dynamic tension, And just as Adler had seen a dynamic tension between superiority and social interest or the limitation of power over, these different archetypal systems balance each other in a way that is very parallel to the balancing of muscle systems in the body. And the formation of a cohesive self depends upon the adequate, we can say with Winnicott, good enough balancing of these archetypal systems. Each have a purpose, and I will simply go quickly around this. Some of you could give this lecture. You've heard me lecture on this before. These four archetypal systems that are components in the building blocks of a mature male or female cohesive little s self are, as even the Freudians are beginning to come to now, these are, these are found in a blueprint which is prior to personal experience. Even the Freudians have now discovered this. It's very fascinating. <clears throat> what uh, Anthony Stevens calls the nurturant archetypal systems, uh, I have called the king and queen line of development, the mythic image of the king and queen relates to these. Very specific line of development having to do with the exercise of power and the capacity for nurturing. What Anthony Stevens talks about as the, agonis, the, the agonic systems, uh, the systems having to do with adversarial fight-flight kinds of behavior. I've used the, the mythic image of the knight or warrior to characterize those, but if you don't like mythic images, it's fine. You can just, just say that these are these, this is an archetypal system uh, which is a line of development for the mature use of one's aggression. This is male and female. The systems that relate to healing that Anthony Stevens talks about in the two million year old self is related to uh, what I have used uh, in the uh, in my work, the mythic image of the magician, the magus, the wise old man. Um, that archetypal system uh, has to do with cognitive functioning. The cognitive psychologies from Piaget on relate to this. That is the capacity to to utilize one's knowledge in a mature and effective way. Later on, we'll see how this relates to community. And what Anthony Stevens talks about as the affiliative uh, archetypal systems, I have denoted with the mythic image of the lover. And uh, so we have four fundamental archetypal systems, 
which are not arbitrary and which are not all over the place, as some folks would like to have us believe. You know, it's very popular to come up with medicine wheels having for this, for that. But I want to suggest that if you look at the evidence, there's a lot of evidence that uh, these four systems uh, uh, are biologically grounded. They function in dynamic interaction with each other, not arbitrarily, not uh, in a way which is accidental. You know, some people talk about archetypes as if you get a bucket and you take a jigsaw puzzle and you dump the jigsaw puzzle in the bucket and then you forget it was a jigsaw puzzle. You reach in the bucket and you get an archetype. And that archetype has no relationship to other archetypes whatsoever. It's just an archetype. Uh, my sense is that that is not the kind of understanding of the archetypal systems that, that Jung had. And certainly it's not that which has been discussed by uh, Anthony Stevens, and it's not mine. I believe that archetypes relate to each other in a meaningful way. And they all are related to the task of developing uh, uh, human primate animals who can become mature and fully functioning in the context of an adequate habitat. So uh, now this doesn't mean there are not other archetypes. If you get into philosophy, Plato or Whitehead or whatever, but when it comes to psychology, scientific psychology, we're talking about things which uh, are not arbitrary. Uh, there is evidence for these things. And uh, the difference between theology and psychological theory is that in psychological theory, we have to relate to evidence. If it's a theory, uh, it can deal with empirical evidence that exists. If it's dogma, if Jung's collected works is the Black Bible, and then all of this has to, to conform to Jung's dogma, it's a totally different thing. Uh, in, the Stephen, in the tradition that Anthony Stevens and I work in, uh, this is not Jung the Black Bible. It's uh, Jung uh, attempting a scientific psychology related to empirical evidence. So <clears throat> I also had noted that you can think about the task of cohesive, the forming cohesion in the human self that the, that the psychoanalytic self-psychologists have discussed can be understood as representing the center point there in that, uh, if you look at the diagram, those arrows around the four quarters delineate tendencies towards splitting in the human self. In other words, as we mature as a self, we have to counteract the tendency for these archetypal systems to do their own thing related to what we call acting out. So if you think about your own psychopathology, you can ask yourself, <clears throat> in your particular brand of psychopathology, which of these archetypal systems tend to be least integrated? therefore leading you to acting out in a very particular way. Turn the cassette over. Anthony Stevens has said that if you look at this, uh, these different archetypal systems and their functioning, then you can understand the way in which psychopathology is related to these archetypal systems not being met adequately by a nurturing environment. And I think he's absolutely right, and I think that it's possible to look at uh, the DSM-3R in the light of which of these particular systems has not been adequately honored in the person's development and uh, has not been adequately integrated into a cohesive little s self. Now, I did not realize when I was trying to figure out how these things related in male and female, that Jung had argued that the double quaternio or the octahedron was a model for the archetypal self, the total archetypal self. 
When I, I had once heard, I realized later, I had once heard James Hall lecturing on that at a Chiron conference. And it was so bad in terms of being an obtuse, very, very vague kind of a, assessment of the, the diagrams in Ion that I could not follow it. But I realized later that I had seen James Hall trying to make sense out of the diagrams of the octahedron in Ion. And not, I had not been able to understand what in the world that had to do with the self. Later on, however, I realized that others, including John Layard, in his book The Celtic Quest, had tried to follow up Jung's understanding of the self, the, uh, the psyche, as organized around an octahedral shape. If you look in John Layard's book, you'll see his delineation of the Mabino the Mabinogian as a model for individuation in attempting to delineate the diamond body of the archetypal self. Finally, I realized that these people were intuiting something that could make sense out of a lot of the things we stumble into, and that is that if you take this quaternio on the left that I have said is a male quaternio, and you take the quaternio on the right, which is, I've said is the female quaternio, and you pick that up and you imagine those, then you get your right brain into this, pick those up and imagine them pyramidal structures, put them base to base with the king and queen facing each other, the warriors facing each other, the magicians facing each other, the lovers facing each other, so that the the sides of the octahedron are connecting on both, on, on these different powers, that you come up with the diagram at the bottom. If you look at this, we don't have enough time to go into this very deeply, but if you look at this and think about some of the things that Jung said about individuation then it's very interesting the way in which it fits a number of his assertions. In my work, I have focused on the way in which at the base of this quaternio, think about it on the base of the pyramidal forms, you have a bipolar tension. As you move toward integration, that tension is balanced. So we can say that the shadow is toward the base of your male or female pyramidal structure. That is, that there's really a bipolar shadow in each one of those lines of development. That, for example, in the, in the warrior or aggression line of development, you have at the base of that pyramid a tension between sadism and masochism, passive and active modes in each one of those bases. Jung had said you need to do your shadow work before you get too deeply into trying to work with the contrasexual. And apparently he thought that was not just accidental, that there was some reason for that. If you look at this, and you assume that there may be some coding deeper in the unconscious for the contrasexual, you can see that work on the contrasexual, trying to achieve a cohesive image of the other, is far deeper, far more difficult, but just as complex as trying to come to an image of the whole cohesive gender formation of psyche that your, your own gendered self represents. This addresses one of the things that people have had so much trouble with in Jung's early formulations. He tended to truncate the view of what the feminine was, and as a lot of us later said, he also truncated what the masculine was. 
If you look at this kind of model for the coding in the schemas, which, if nurtured, deploy a cohesive male or female self, you will notice that the fullness of masculinity and the fullness of femininity are symmetrical. That is to say, each gender has the task of integrating these four archetypal systems and the potentials and the conflicts which they represent. What is the asymmetry, if any? Jung noted from his clinical work the phenomena that he called a lessening of masculine energy in the man toward midlife and a lessening of feminine energy in the female toward midlife. A lot of the research reported by Gutmann relates this not solely but to actual hormonal changes in male and females. That is to say, there is evidence that corresponding to this change noticed in clinical work and noticed in this cross-cultural research that as male testosterone levels go down, there's also a gradual increase in estrogen in the male. So there is a hormonal pattern that corresponds in some parallel to this. And also, Goodman notes that there are studies showing that testosterone, the relative testosterone level increases in females as estrogen levels decline somewhat. So there's some biological uh, fueling of this kind of reflection. But what I want to suggest to you is that the asymmetry does not have to do with male or female. It has to do with the asymmetry reported by these researchers on where the line of development of aggression comes to full development in males and where it tends to come to development in, in females. That the asymmetry is on that horizontal axis that you see on those top two diagrams. Notice that the asymmetry is there and not on the vertical axis. Remember what I said to you about Gutmann's research findings that say that males and females both have to struggle with their increased narcissism toward the latter part of their lives? The king and queen images relate to the challenge of generativity that we human beings face as we move toward older, older years. Are we going to become useless or will we be generative elders in a community? So uh, it is not in the struggle for moving out of one second, second experience of, prime, of, of narcissism uh, to a kind of co community-based generativity that divides us. We both, we both, males and females, have the struggle toward getting past our desire to retire later in life and to reinvest in the community. And it is not in this, this, this uh, young adulthood task of de-idealization that uh, is represented in that uh, increasing cognitive maturity where we are asymmetrical. You know, in early life, we have a lot of idealizations that we put on all kinds of people. And it is that cognitive development that enables us to withdraw those idealizations, hopefully non-traumatically traumatic de-idealization, of course, is a big problem, and our young people in our world today are having tremendous difficulties with that. Difficulties in idealization, difficulties in withdrawing idealizations without becoming depressed and suicidal. So it's not on this vertical axis that the asymmetry comes. Great deal of evidence says that the asymmetry comes on that horizontal axis between eros and aggression and that historically there has been a tendency 
for there to be an asymmetry in life cycle about that. Now this is extremely important because a lot of the stereotypes in the discussions of masculinity and femininity have tended to talk as if males were aggra more aggressive throughout the life cycle. And so there's been all this discussion about male aggression and uh, male violence as if males are more aggressive all the time. But I think this research helps us to get a little more of a sense of what is going on with us. It is not that males are more aggressive. We'll get into in our discussion, hopefully, about the issue of whether this is all socially constructed or whether some of it's biological. But regardless, Males are not more aggressive totally. They're just more aggressive first half of life. Females have a problem with aggression in the second half of life. Females struggle with their affiliative, uh, flooding of affiliative needs early in life. Males struggle with their flooding with affiliative needs in the second half of life. So there is a lot less asymmetry between the genders if you look at this thing in the context of the life cycle, then uh, have previous arguments have, have led us to believe. Now, is this biological or merely socially constructed? In my view, our inherited biological characteristics do influence this. However, we've got to be careful about not understanding something very specific about our species and some other species. That is to say that culture and spirituality are a part of our species behavior. In other words, culture and spirituality are biological. They're not something else. And so when traditional cultures dealt more constructively with male aggression than our contemporary culture does, that wasn't something other than our species adapting. It was us being the animal that mythologizes, the animal that ritualizes, the animal that creates symbolic universes to help, to help it adapt. Goodman points out that with the, with the decline of the mythic sacred canopy of indigenous peoples around the world, they are falling into the same dysfunctional patterns that modern America is in. That is to say, we are not engaging in the kind of cultural formulations and creativity and spiritual uh, paradigms which enable us to cope with our causal past, as Whitehead would say, in a creative way, and to help us deal with the inherited asymmetrical tendencies which we have as a species. Now, what does this, I've got only a few moments now before we have to open this discussion, but let me say this. What does this mean then for our looking at this whole task that we face and trying to create a viable habitat for humanity and our other species that we need in order to be humans. It means that we must, whatever the causes of this asymmetry on eros and aggression, we must face a number of things. We must face that we have to challenge social policy which enhances these tendencies to split in different aspects of life. And we must form spiritual spiritualities and community values which support the movement toward cohesiveness in both male and female selves as early as possible. Let me give you a, 
disturbing example. I always get attacked when I say this, but until we have an equal amount of money going into female athletics as we have going into male athletics, we are socially engineering young women who have not had an opportunity to develop their aggressive, adversarial, aversive, adaptive aggression behaviors uh, in a way that can help them not act in modes which uh, make them prey for every dysfunctional male that comes along. In other words, it is not, ac it is not accidental that, that in our society that these athletic programs are structured the way they are. This is a kind of an acting out, a sort of a species acting out of these old patterns. It shows our lack of awareness of what is really going on with regard to the dysfunctionality, uh, with regard to this asymmetry. We have to do everything we can to help young males deal with their affiliative archetypal systems earlier. Now, the issue of whether males could ever be as good on affiliative systems as young females? That's an empirical question. Let's see. And the question of whether young females could ever be as good on aversive and adversarial archetypal systems as young males, that's an empirical question. It's not a matter of dogma. But the issue that we must create social, community, and spiritual paradigms which face these different archetypal systems and the need to balance them creatively uh, is a must. Now, what does this have to do with psychotherapy? It has a lot to do with psychotherapy, and it has a great deal to do with Jung's vision of wholeness and individuation. That is to say, wholeness is not just a mystical term. Its individuation is not just a vague, esoteric term that some mystic Jung created. He intuited some of the greatest progress in research in psychoanalytic self-psychology. He was the pioneering self-psychologist. And what we've got to do is to pick up where he left off in trying to actually create forms which facilitate wholeness and cohesiveness in both male and female selves. We are one. We are united in the necessity of balancing these archetypal systems. They are the same kind of systems in male and female. The task is to help us get beyond some of our inheritance, which leads us to have more difficulty in some integration at different aspects of the life cycle. So let me open this now for some questions. We have just a few minutes, and you have to take a break. Peter has the mic. I think we should show our appreciation before we ask questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Continuing generosity. That's no. it. Now questions, now. comments? Yes. I was interested to hear um, comments about a biobehavioral hormonal um, view of this splitting. And I would like to suggest that one way to test this hypothesis would be to look at um, menopausal women who are now on estrogen replacement therapy mm -hmm. and look at whether this this pattern continues or absolutely there are a lot of things that about this Jungian stuff you know the alienation of Jungians from empirical research is not because of Jungian psychology or concepts it's just that we don't have people that pursue some of these things this is would be a, a very important research thing but I want to emphasize uh, I work a lot trying to help us deal with very practical problems we have so many let me just give you an example Say we know that men's testosterone declines. We know also that they become very passive as they get older, that this is a tremendous problem that is not being studied in geriatrics very much. You can't get very much money to study the problems of older males 
in geriatrics now. And, and we have a problem that's very interesting to me. We have all of these young males in our culture who, are, who have no older male that's really involved with them. And they have a lot of aggressivity. We have got a lot of passive older males who are on the golf course, retired, who are depressed because they have nothing useful to do. It's fascinating to me that this life cycle problem has to, we have to find ways to get beyond the biology. Testosterone replacement doesn't help older males all that much. We have to deal with this culturally and spiritually and in terms of uh, ritual forms. I think that we could, we could radically transform the degree of violence in our society if we could get these older males to accept the traditional role of peace chiefs in the community with younger males. Other comments or questions? By the, by the way, uh, castration of young males is not an option. Castration is not an option. Thank you. Glad to hear that. And there are a lot of other young males that would be glad to hear that, too. I fully agree with your idea to prevent splitting, to, that our culture should have designs to prevent splitting. I don't think um, putting a lot of money into girls' competitive athletics is necessarily the way to do that. Because um, in a way, it's like sort of women smoking as much as men to, be, to become more equal. <laughs> And I've watched. I don't agree with well, that. Well, okay. Well, I, I just want to say that I, I mean, I think that we're better off uh, making it financially and socially viable for men to teach nursery school and kindergarten and to be more involved with the children. And as far as competitive sports, I've watched my son, who's a very loving, gender conscious, egalitarian, competitive kid, mm -hmm. become gradually, systemat systematically socialized into the world of competition and to care a lot about winning and losing and to you know, to sort of um, rev up his emotions about a game and then to cut them off mm -hmm. at the end. And, you know, for me as, you know, a member of, an, you know, the, an alien species watching this, um, it's difficult. I don't like the effect that it has on him. I mean, it doesn't generalize to his other relationships, mm -hmm. but I, I don't think, I think we need to transform our whole concept of competitive sports rather than to get women to participate in it equally. It'll be interesting to see what you think when you're 50. <laughs> well, because because I think what we've got to keep our mind on. I mean, I mean, I, of course, uh, competitive sports is not the answer. I, I simply want to support those women who are trying to get more equity for female athletics because it's not just a little druther. It, there is a serious issue here. Uh, the issue is the adequate development of the capacity to deal with one's own aggression and to overcome the necessity to be nice. Being nice is not a virtue for males or females. And we've got to get we've got to get past that. Yes. I'm concerned that if we view the elder male as that as we view the elder male as more nurturing and more sensitive and and therefore as more feminine in this Jungian voice. And, and we also see him becoming more suicidal and, and depressed. That what we are really looking at is the de devaluing of the feminine within the culture. Mm -hmm. And that as he takes that on as, as a balancing piece of, of his world, of his psyche and his life, uh, that, that whether he is aware of it or not, he is picking up that devalued piece. And, and so it is, it is coming through him in that, in that very scary, sad, and negative way, instead of being able to take on that peaceful uh, leader role um, and, and nurturing other folks, he is instead turning it on himself. Yes. Well, I, I must not have commit, communicated very clearly. I don't think that the man's nurturance in midlife and later is feminine. I think that it is an affiliative subsystem of the human self and that that's when he gets into it. And I don't think that the female's increasing aggression as she gets older and her claim of power is male. And so uh, there's no doubt that the values of affiliation and love and uh, cooperation are undervalued. There's no doubt about that. If, uh, 
if but they are they are they are undervalued often in older women and what you've got to see is there are many many women who are leaving their families today uh, after midlife because their affiliative subsystems have become less pronounced in their interest and so what we've got to understand at least in my view my point of view is that those including Goodman, who have considered this increasing, this increasing value of affiliation and nurturance in males as female, are missing the fact that these are archetypal systems that relate to both the male and the female self, and that we, our challenge is to, to move toward a balance of these systems as early as possible and to maintain them as long as possible in both males and females. So I must have miscommunicated that, yes. Uh, what you said today was really helpful to me. First of all, I have a daughter who is, who is a really loving daughter, and she was just a fierce soccer player. And I couldn't understand that. It made me very tense, but she taught me something. But I was with this daughter on a tram in the Grand Canyon, and there was a young mother with a baby boy and a little older boy and a father. And the older boy and the father left the tram, and it was raining, and the mother was left with the baby, and as they left, the little boy said, are you going to pick us up? The mother was so furious that these two males were walking off, expecting her and this baby to pick her up in the rain. And then after they left, the mother started teasing the baby boy. And he, he was a, a, a beautiful baby, and all of a sudden he got so furious, he was raging. Everybody on this tram was tense about this mother and the baby boy. I think if this mother had been a soccer player, she would have learned how to channel her aggressions and she wouldn't have attacked this baby. So not only does it have, help females, right. it helps us all, I think. Thank you for that. And let me say one last thing, and I'm out of time, and I'll stick around a little while uh, to chat, but, but there, there is emphasis that primate studies have shown that older primate females, other than our own primate species, that, that a lot of the time it is the that, that it is the older primate females, when the young are endangered, the older primate females who have developed more of their capacity for aggression uh, who defend the young. That the stereotypes of the males being the ones that defend the young uh, is not complete. It's not a, it's not a balanced view. Uh, so the, the issue is wholeness. The issue is individuation. And the issue is individuation and wholeness as soon as possible and held on to as long as possible so that we can have a viable community. Thank you very much.